a proud member of the Earglue Media family of podcasts. Welcome to the Film Appraisers, the podcast that evaluates your favorite films. We are glad that you could join us today. If this is your first time listening to our show. We do things just a little different on this podcast. So each episode, we're going to talk about a film that either a listener or a guest or one of the hosts bring to the show, and then we're going to appraise it. We're going to see how much it's worth, but we do so in each of the following categories, narrative, music, technique, uniqueness, and longevity. Each of those categories can get a maximum $20,000 for a possible $100,000 for the most valuable film. We'll see where it stands next to classics and other films brought to us that we talked about on the show. My name is Josh, and today we will jump into the world of Lucasfilm to talk about a 1988 fantasy from George Lucas and Ron Howard. Today we'll be discussing Willow, and that's starring Warwick Davis, Val Kilmer, and Joanne Wally. And I half expected maybe like a little comment from Joe when I mentioned the words Joanne Wally. Uh, maybe we get into that a little bit a little bit later. I'm saving the best for later, you know. <laughs> So you ready for this? This is episode 30, Sword, Sorcery, and Sorcia. Yeah, that episode was titled Just For You, Joe. And, and, and you heard him there, folks. He's here with me today. It's Joe Kane. I am thrilled to be here. You know what? I'm actually thrilled. I'm actually thrilled that I didn't hate this. I was so worried I was going to hate it. Yeah, it's been a while since we've done a film that we weren't super high on. Oh, you're saying like after having watched it yeah. that you didn't hate yeah, it. Yeah, 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 for sure. I was, I mean, I was... uh. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't nervous about it, but, uh, I expected to, I expected to not yeah. like this going back. You don't, it doesn't usually last when you go back that far into your childhood. Yeah. 1988. I mean, it's, it, this film's got some age on it and it, and it does show, but it also, it, it, it holds up fairly well. All right. Before we get started, our third co-host, Todd, where, where's Todd Blankenship nah. today? Is he showing up? He's currently in the back room honking away. I still. Still don't know how to turn him back to a person. <laughs> there you go. Very well. You just got to use the wand, Willow. I tried that, but he didn't seem to like it. <laughs> so I think I was using it wrong. Before we, yeah, yeah, before we get started, folks, a uh, little bit of an advertisement from us here. We, we want to let you know that the new year, we're starting uh, our Patreon. We, we'd always held off a little bit on it. Uh, we got a lot of demand from folks to, to, to get that started, to offer some additional perks. And so we're going to do that, and and we'll be rolling that out later this month. It's January of 2021. So later this month, you'll see that come out, and we're really excited to give you uh, some additional things that will be associated with our show, some bonus episodes, a little bit of a chance for for folks to, to guide the direction of the show uh, for those who want to help support it. So be looking for that. Uh, really excited about it. Yeah, I think it's going to be cool. I think it's going to help us afford the opportunity to to provide some some of that extra content people have been asking for. Um, mm -hmm. I think it go a long ways towards keeping the lights on here at Film Appraisers HQ. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. All right. Today we are talking Willow. How how did I come up with Willow? I did. It has something it to do with started, Disney Plus. <laughs> it had to do with the most boring topic ever, and that is the Disney shareholder phone call. <laughs> and <laughs> A few of us were watching that uh, as we were doing other things. Uh, definitely were talking on Discord as as some of the information from Disney Plus was being revealed to us. And that whole Disney shareholder call, uh, I think it was last month, w was all based on streaming service. It was all basically Disney Plus stuff. Well, that's all they've got. And and that's that's what they've got right now. Yeah, the parks yeah. aren't doing much. But they mentioned a new series, Willow. And when that got talked about on Discord, uh, everybody was very high on it. A lot of good feedback. Since since then, we've been posting pictures, talking about Willow, and uh, it just seems like it's a it's something that a lot of people hold really dear, dear to their hearts. So we we said we wanted to do it. Uh, I'm I'm definitely in that list as uh, really really liking this film, regardless of where it ends up on our on our list uh, of being appraised. Uh, it's just it's a really popular one, Joe. I think a lot of people just really love this film, especially uh, those who grew up with it. Yeah, well, I think it it appeals broadly enough age group wise that you probably could have been like born 
we'll say end of 70s towards to the early 90s and it would still appeal to mm-hmm. you in that whole range yeah so i think in that age group it has a very nostalgic grab to it with it being lucasfilm it, right in the heart of uh, of that era of lucasfilm it's got that formula that, oh, that really very works well george lucas yeah it, it's, so i watched it with my with my son uh, he's he's seven years old and sometimes whenever we watch films that it's okay for him to watch, I will judge some of my longevity based on uh, like a litmus test of where it falls for him. It ticked, it checked all the boxes for uh, a seven year old boy who's into the star Wars and, and uh, Avengers and things like that. It worked perfectly for, for his. So it's the formula still works. Yeah. I mean, well, it's, the, the formula here that we're looking at is very largely like the hero's journey formula. Lucas loves yeah. to just plant mm-hmm. right against, uh, and it is a little formulaic or whatever, but it is like the, the foundation of all hero stories kind of at this yeah. point, at least, at least the ones that are trying to tell a story and not just, uh, I mean, you do get some like, large action film kind of blockbustery things that are just special effects and killing things that don't necessarily follow too tightly. But even those still have hero journey influences in them. I mean, it's kind of mm-hmm. pervasive, uh, but, yeah. but, but Lucas really, his stories tend to basically to a T follow, follow that, that format. And you can, it's all over this. I mean, you got everything, the call to action, the, the return home, like it's got mm-hmm. everything, you know, as it lands, uh, yeah. Which I uh, does uh, to me. It does affect the uniqueness, right? But mm-hmm. uh, I think it made for a pretty amazing film. So, yeah, it's interesting. It, it it probably affects the uniqueness, but it probably helps the longevity because that hero's journey formula just works with human beings and storytelling. It works. That's 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 interesting. How that could uh, one could offset the other a little bit. All right, so the log line for this film is a young farmer is chosen to undertake a perilous journey in order to protect a special baby from an evil queen. That's it. That's exactly it. So for those of you who don't know, you know Willow is a Willow is a story, a, a young young race of people. I guess they're, ra- they're race, right? The the Nell ones, they're they're a race. Yeah, is that what that would be? Yeah, I mean it's uh they're they're the hobbits in this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's it. Yeah, they're the hobbits. Willow, the main character, comes across a, a baby in the river. The baby is to fulfill a prophecy uh, that she will she will overtake and destroy the the evil queen that runs the land. So so Willow's taken child back to uh, they, they call the uh, normal or regular sized people Daikinis, which is real interesting. The whole whole different language they've got going on in this film. That's also a very Lucas thing to do. It's for real. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Everything's got a weird name and. Yeah, it, we'll get to maybe when we talk about the the giant two headed monster. It's funny uh, the name that came up with uh, for that creature and why he why he chose to do it. Uh, but yeah, Will Will's on this journey to take this uh, take this child and uh, across the way, of course, they are being tracked by the evil queen and her and her troops. And uh, he runs across a cast of characters. And if you know the hero's journey, you know where this thing's going to go. Uh, but it's a good it's a good film. It, it didn't do. I don't think it did super well at the box office. I, I know it probably made its money back worldwide, but this wasn't a, a smash runaway hit for Lucasfilm at the box office. No, I mean, okay, so it's hard for me to go back to the cultural zeitgeist of 88 as I was one and a half years old when this came out. <laughs> um, but this does not have the... I feel like it just doesn't have the sales kind of grab like I could imagine this not being one that was easy to get people in the theater on right yeah. it doesn't all those fantasy films in the 80s though they did they never really did well in the theaters but they have a they have a following well, I mean you think about like Willow or Labyrinth or yeah they have a or legend they have like a cult, you know those kinds of films they have a cult following now but I feel like there was a lot of, like actually I think that's I'm going to back that up I think the good ones have a cult following now but if yeah. you go back to that time period I'm going to say like late 70s through late 80s maybe early 90s there was Mm -hmm. a ton of these and a lot of them were trash and i think that's why 
and the ones that are trash, nobody talks about and nobody can think of. Yeah. Right. And I think that's why these films were all just kind of disregarded at the time is just, it was just too much of, of this, like everybody wanted to make a Lord of the Rings film without the license. Yeah. Cause there were a lot of them in the eighties. And I mean, we, we talked, we talked about Hawk the Slayer not too long ago. There's just, there's so many. And if you go on Amazon Prime, for some reason, they have a ton for free on, on Amazon Prime. You could, you could stay busy for well, weeks they can get the, watching They can those. get the rights to them for a dime a piece probably, right? Nobody <laughs> wants to watch them, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Maybe it has to do with when, when those are introduced in the 80s, uh, late 70s and 80s, the group that's watching them, they're, they're our, our age now, so the the they grew up with them. They like them. And, uh, and that's why the cult following is there yeah. and not the people who are paying a ticket when it comes out. Well, I, yeah, well, I think it's the, it's the good ones rise to the top, but they just don't do it quickly. Right. I, I mean, the same thing kind of happens if you look at like the late nineties through mid two thousands, there was like, mm-hmm. that was a lot of like the buddy comedies and stuff. And a lot of those were total flops. But if you go, oh, I'll say mid nineties through, but if you go back to, I mean, like just Example off the top of my head, like Office Space, right? That movie yeah. totally flopped, but that's probably largely because there was like a new one of those mm-hmm. twice a month. So people just yeah. didn't it's go. It's like see- the teen movies yeah, in the nineties. Yeah, it's just, it's just exactly. like a period where these things are hot and heavy. But and the they, ones, they the ones people, the ones that stuck around, the ones that just didn't disappear at a time, are the ones that are good. And the ones mm-hmm. that are really good out of that group are the ones that end up with like the big cult followings and stuff like Willow. I, I, Willow, I would say has a nostalgic feel and people really like it. I will also say up until that earnings call, I had not heard anybody mention Willow in probably 10 years. Yeah. Right. It's not like it's, yeah. it's not like it's hugely popular in this cult way. It's just one that people like because it was one of the good ones. It's been a few years since I watched it, the, but the last time I did watch it, it had been like 10 years since I watched it before that time. And when I, at that point, I was nervous, really nervous watching it, thinking this is going to ruin, ruin a lot. But when I watched it, I, I remember thinking, oh, this is not bad. This is really holding up. And then, you know, a lot of time pass and we're, we're here where we are now. And, you know, I still feel the same. It's, it, it holds up fairly well. I remembered the last time I watched it watched it i know we talked about it and it took me and i couldn't remember it and it took me a while but this weekend when i was watching it sitting at the bar with a drink watching a movie and thinking about it uh i i had like the flashback to the last time i saw it and i want to say i was in second or third grade and it was it was the last day of school and they piled us all into the auditorium and just put the movie on that's funny. And that was second grade. They did that. Yeah. Right? Second or third grade. Yeah. Wow. Like, that was the last time I saw this film and it was on like a 21 inch CRT and 130 <laughs> kids were watching it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, it was on that cart. It was, it was that hundred percent on somebody that cart, wheeled in the car. Somebody <laughs> had to adjust the tracking on the VCR because it was all messed up <laughs> for sure. All of those things are true. Um, oh gosh. And they had it like the person who wheeled in those TVs on the carts <laughs> yeah. in school was like the hero always of the class. Everybody was like, always whoever so happy wheeled to that see in. It, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Like That's one of the best films. I don't know. It was always, always, uh, it was always the head janitor, which like mm-hmm. head janitor. I think there was like three at my school. I didn't go to a big school. Um, but it was always the head janitor that brought the, the TV cart in. Uh, and he was also like besides the TV cart, he was also just a super cool dude. So, uh, yeah. everybody loved him. Uh, he was definitely a school hero, but yeah, you saw that TV even if, even before, even if like, and that was the other thing too. Oh, the person always came in back first, right? It was always cart second. Like they opened the door and they pushed the door out of the way yeah. with their back. And then you'd, yeah, yeah, you'd yeah, see yeah. them yeah, like right. scooting in with it. And you're like, yeah, here comes what do you the got? TV. <laughs> yeah. Wait, in sixth grade, the last day of school, uh, the teacher wheeled in uh, the cart and put on the princess bride. Oh, was, nice. What? It was, it was pretty wild. I, and even um, the teachers just gathered around and wa- and watched it. Like, nobody did anything. I also have to say, and I normally don't comment on this on the show, uh, but uh, I, for some reason, really dig the theatric release poster for this. Oh, yeah. So it's, that's funny you said that because I just purchased a book uh, yesterday on Amazon uh, uh, for the guy that, um, uh, gosh, what's his name? Joe, uh, Joe Alvin, 
think his uh, name. Yeah, sounds right. Joe, John, Joe, and, John, uh, something. Albert, yeah. Yeah, I can't believe I can't remember it. Yeah, that, yeah Albert's screaming at us right now, for sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. He um, knew off the top of his head before we started this conversation <laughs> who it was. Right. Uh, John, uh, John, John, Alvin. John Alvin. John Alvin. John Alvin, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so it's The Art of John Alvin, uh, which, uh, man, I, I love art of books uh, for, for a lot of reasons. But this has all his, uh, not all of his, but a lot of his movie posters. And it's unbelievable how many amazing movie posters this guy has done in his life. And uh, I'm really excited for that book. I'll, I'll post some pictures whenever we Yeah, that'd be uh, cool. I'd, I'd like to one. see some of those because I, I, I don't know what else he's done, but it's got a very familiar art style to it to me. So I'm sure I could pull mm-hmm. and recognize a couple of them, but it is really good. Yeah, he's got like uh, Aliens, Blade Runner, okay. yeah, okay. uh, E.T. All right, you had me a Blade um, Runner. Yep, okay. Yep. <laughs> We're uh, good. The Batman 89, he did the Batman 89 yep. one. Uh, it's, it's. oh yeah, I'm really excited for that book. This is what, totally. Uh, we're totally still talking about the movie. Hey, this is just like our last reactions episode when we say it right ta- on. Topic. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, we'll jump into the ranking because that's where we get a lot of the, the discussion about the film. We get into a lot of detail when we do our our appraisal version. But you you told a little bit about the history of it uh, when you when you sat down and watched it this time. Uh, what was that like for you? You had you said you were at the bar. It, your 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 home bar. Home bar, yeah. There's no such uh, thing yeah, as a public bar anymore. <laughs> <laughs> not if you're, uh, yeah, not if you're risking it. Uh, so with me, I sat down. I did have my son with me. I, I you know, looking back at seeing how the ending uh, was a little bit more violent than I remember it. Yep. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, swords. Yeah. Uh, slow motion swords going into people and things like that. So I. Probably looking back, I, I I don't know if you if you've got kids and you're wondering should should my kids watch this? Well, first of all, just just watch the movie. You'll know your you know your own kids. Yeah, the, the, you know the violence wouldn't have been the thing that that cued me on that. Like the, the violence, I mean, it was a little violence, but like some of the like the magic effects were borderline yeah. Cronenberg esque. They were like yeah, like the body horror was rough. Like when you're turning mm-hmm. into pigs and stuff, I was like oof. Or the body, the, 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 the troll, the, uh, was, yeah, the pigs thing. Yeah, the mm-hmm. pigs thing was rough. The troll with like the like birds or whatever, like trying to eat it the way yeah. up from the inside. Like, yeah. uh, some of that stuff was pretty gnarly. I mean, I was digging it, but it was pretty gnarly. It, depending on how, how well your kid uh, can handle certain things. I mean, it feels like probably the age range of this film safely, uh, maybe nine, 10. It, it's tough because every kid's different, but I, I'd say I'd probably wait a couple years if it was my kid again, or just, you know, just skip the skip some parts. There's some parts you can skip. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff though, up until that, till the very end. I'd say probably like the third act is probably where you really got to pay attention on on what your kids see. Speaking of acts, uh, I felt like the pacing was. I, I'm not gonna say bad. I know I talked to mm-hmm. I talked to you, and my initial feeling on it was I didn't like it. Uh, but yeah. that was early in the film. I just hadn't seen a lot of it, and. I felt like it was inconsistent. I feel like it had a like a weird slow mm. midsection, mm-hmm. uh, like mm-hmm. probably like the end of the first act, beginning of the second act felt like like it slowed way down before it picked back up. Yeah. Uh, and you know, a little behind the curtain, I I'm still like on the more tired than usual side things coming back coming back <laughs> right. from the from the COVID, uh, and that slowdown felt very slow to me. I was like. Uh, I was not digging it, um, but when it picked back up, it it picked way up. Like the the yeah. the last bit of this film is is pretty great. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think um, I think if I had to criticize the pacing on this, I would say that the first you know the first third and a bit, maybe or maybe not quite half, needed to be a little more consistently paced. But other than that, it was not bad. Yeah, I think overall there is an inconsistency in in the pacing. I think the pacing at the beginning is a different kind of pacing because it's not boring. It's just not it, it's not as consistent as the other pacing you get. In the third act, man, you get some some action, and they sprinkle a little bit of action in the second act. But it's like the first act. Of course, it's going to be a little slower just for the exposition, but it does. It does start and stop each scene that works well onto the next one. And there's not a huge lull, but it, you're right. It is paced a little, it's just paced a little different than, than some of the other acts. It's, it held my attention. Uh, but yeah, it's, a, it's paced a little different. So I have a question for you. I, I watched a, the, the, the Blu-ray mm-hmm. master of this 
the ma- the master that I watched was the audio was mixed horribly. It was that that um, I want to say it was more common in the eighties and nineties than it is now. But you still yeah. run into it where the dialogue is a quarter of the volume of everything else, yeah. uh, and that drives me nuts. I hate having to adjust the volume constantly yeah. during the film. Was was yeah. it like that for you too? No. So I I owned the re released Blu Ray version. Uh, guess what? A few years back. And uh, the version I watched, though, is so I I ripped this to Plex and I don't exactly know if Plex uses that same version or if it's like, you know, I don't know how their software works. I, I assume you probably are watching the same version. Well, but I don't I know. There's so there, that. there I mean, is, they could be their source. It, there is a remastered and a release and a original release on Blu-ray. I wonder if you have the remastered release on Blu-ray. I didn't notice anything, like you said. So it, yeah, it may have been a remastered version. Been that, but it was it was rough. Like there were times when I had to turn the volume up because I couldn't hear what Willow was saying. Mm-hmm. And then the following scene was like music or something that was yeah. so loud it like I was watching with headphones on and it was so loud it was like audibly it was like uncomfortable. <laughs> right. I was like the 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 swing and I wonder what if I wonder if that was the theatric experience too. It's curious. Uh, I well, I really hate you that. Brought up, yeah, I, it it that's very annoying. You you brought up pacing. That was a big part of what I had to talk about in narrative. Let's jump into that. Let's get into the five categories that we use to determine how valuable a film is. Now remember when we talk about these uh, for those that you may be listening for the first time, we're just trying to figure out how much is this thing worth. We're we're not trying to rank this thing as far as you know, some some sort of IMDb or Rotten Tomato score or even our own personal. Hey, personal, this thing is in my top 25. Love, love, love this thing. But think about it in terms of, you know, like taking it to the pawn shop or uh, the, the, the Antiques Roadshow, right? Yeah. We're, yeah how we're, much is this thing? Break, how much is this thing worth? We're breaking it down by part and looking at how those parts are and not necessarily looking at it uh, like, you know. When you love a film, it's because the sum, typically it's because the sum is greater than its parts, right? You find whatever emotional connection to the thing, or um, it's a subject matter you love, or maybe you just have like a huge crush on somebody in the film and it makes you love it more. <laughs> what are you talking about? I don't know what you mean. <laughs> and uh, like, There's a bunch of things that play in. There's a bunch of things that play into how you feel about a film that are not necessarily like how it would look from a film theory, film critic uh, standpoint. You know, these are like, you know, so you have films that people bury like a perfect example, right? For me, Galaxy Quest, that was a film that got buried because they didn't think it had an audience and they didn't think it was very good because so they didn't advertise it. They just released it and let it go. And then it turned out to have like, it actually has like a huge cult following now. And then there's documentaries about it. And, you know, uh, Ebert says it's a perfect film and like, but they didn't give it that chance. Cause when they looked at it, like on paper, it's like, you know, what, what do we get? We got like a mid sixties for it. So, yeah. you know, it's not a, you know, that's a mid sixties. It's not a thing you throw a ton of money behind. Um, yeah, we're like we're looking at the like the critical nature of a film, not necessarily or like the like the by the book nature of the film, not necessarily how we feel about it. Well said. So here's what I came up with on narrative when I took a look at this thing. I ended up about twelve thousand five hundred for narrative. How I got to that number, I took it. Take a look at most of these categories. I I tend to break them in, or most of these, uh, yeah, these categories, these sections, I I break into subcategories. I thought with the acting, uh, man, could they have found a more adorable child to play <laughs> Alora Dannon? Well, actually, I, I said that in my notes, and then I, I found out, yeah, they could. They found four different kids to play <laughs> to play her across that film. But, you know, the facial expressions they got from, from those babies, man, that is valuable stuff when you have a baby in your film. So I thought I thought even down to the to the to the babies uh did pretty good. Uh the child actors I thought they did really well. And, Speaking of child, I mean Warwick Davis looks like a looks so he young in this very film. young, so young. <laughs> I, the part that's on right now uh, that I've got playing the actor that plays the the lead uh, sorcerer in the village is the same guy from uh, Masters of the Universe uh, movie, which I know our friend uh, 
Mike loves that It's one movie, of his favorite movies. So. Yeah, I have no idea why, but it's, he really loves it. Yeah, if you're listening to this and and you want to tell him about it, you should hop yeah. on Discord he, and tell him. He won't hear because he, he will talk for hours about. He it. He won't hear this, but we're letting no, we're letting we're this. letting you know that uh, you should go ask him about it because he will love it. Yeah, ask us and we'll give you his personal email so you can email him about yep, it for sure. But no, that I thought there's a lot of great little scenes with the actors and actresses, Willow and his wife as they depart. Some really tender moments there. I thought some of those scenes were better than anything Titanic ever threw at us. Um, now there are some choice acting in in this film. You know, uh, you you'll see things like uh, the guy at the meeting, the village meeting. Who'll do that? You know, just little things like that. It's some silly acting choices. Migosh, his buddy, does not really come across as as the, the the best acting. But I mean, overall, it's it's okay. It's it suits the film fine. It's there's nothing wrong with it. The things that really stand out for me in in the narrative uh, were the costume and then and then the story and the plot with the costumes. So the costume design actually won a Saturn Award, a Barbara Lane. And you can see why there's some really cool costumes in here, some real memorable ones like General Kale's mask. I thought I really, really liked that. The story and the plot, though, this is where this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. There are point there are sections in this film that just I absolutely love. And it's so for me, this is my own personal thing. They just, they work really well. I, at the opening of this movie, I really love the opening. I like that big build up and the swelling of the music to where we get the title. And the, I, I put it in discord, the picture of the title. It's like the composition so well framed. You got the midwife and then this gorgeous background and then this open space of the composition where the title gets filled. And the lettering of that title is, is awesome. I, I, love, I love when titles fill the screen and, and it's just real unique lettering uh, when it comes to films. Uh, that whole montage uh, of the midwife taking care of the baby. I, I, I love that. Uh, the pacing we talked about, so I won't jump into that. But this is definitely a Lucasfilm through and through. It's got, this, it's got Lucasfilm's DNA just you know completely throughout this film. It's covered uh, in it. They, they they do a really good job, and, and that's right. It it it's covered in it, and it and it works. They do a really good job making their films relatable to their market, and that's the seven to twelve year old. I mean, they they nail it. It is they nail it, and we get classic Lucasfilm scenes throughout this thing, traveling on something in a chase, like the wagon scene. Think of any Indiana Jones film that's got that scene in it. Um, you know, it made me think as I was watching this film, it made me think about uh, in Rise of Skywalker, where they've got the classic, you know, uh, chase scene uh, where they, you know, the stormtroopers they find out can fly now. Uh, they, the cut scenes to the queen are very reminiscent of all those cut scenes you get throughout the Star Wars saga. Yeah, well, uh, I, like cutting back to the emperor. Will, right? Willow it's is just like that. Willow is basically Luke, right? Yes, he's yeah, even like, he's even learning yeah, he's, he's even learning his his magic the whole time through, right? That's right. right. Yeah, and 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 it's it's still that portion, it's still that time period of Lucasfilm where it was the characters are written well. Like remember, here's what works with Luke, and I don't want to get off on a tangent. Here's why Luke I think works better for a, a lot of people than Ray is because Luke's not perfect. Luke does not get things right at all. And the same thing happens to Will. He's not perfect. He's got so many challenges up against him and he screws up from time to time. And so that, that to me, because we're in that era of Lucasfilm, I think that still works with the character. Heck, we still even get the same swipes uh, for the scene transitions like we do through Star Wars. The yeah. humor's a lot like Lucasfilm from so. that period. Very much, especially, uh, and the humor doesn't really land. We're starting to creep a little bit closer to like the prequel type humor. Not, not necessarily, but... You know, there's there's some good lines in there. Like when one of the brownies tells the guy, "Your mother was a lizard." That, I laughed at that. That's funny. So, the humor it's the same. Uh, what I really like about this film, what I really like about the story and the plot, is when you can sum up the film in a line, and you got to look for it. And but films do this all the time. If you find the line, it sums up the film for you. And and in this one, it it's when. Uh, it's when Willow, you know, tells him, you need a warrior to do this, not me. I'm a nobody. And that's just, I love that when they do that. So it's got some things going for it. It's got some things that aren't going for it. It takes a lot for this film to get up to like a $20,000 in the narrative. Uh, there's, there's some, there's some dings that are, that are here. And that's why I got to 12,500. Yeah. I, uh, I was, 
close a uh, little higher than you. Um, I think the the biggest difference, most of my notes uh, line up directly with yours. Uh, I felt like uh, the the ding I have that you didn't bring up was I felt like the romance stuff with mm-hmm. Med Mardigan and Shorsha felt a little forced and awkward in spots. Yeah. It did not seem yeah. to fit well. Um, and I know they kind of handled with that with like the potion thing, but even with mm-hmm. the potion thing, it still didn't feel like, like dude said four words and all of a sudden yeah. she was in and he was under a potion, not her. Right. There's yeah. some weirdness there, uh, but not a ton. I think the thing that why I ended up higher than you though, was like you said you were, you genuinely enjoyed the acting for the most part. Uh, some of it was, uh, you give a couple of examples of being a little over top or a little like, uh, well, even Mad Mardigan's acting or Val Kilmer's acting is not, it's just very, so I think Lucasfilm 80s yes, type. Acting. I think I was higher clunky. on it though, because I think that I don't think that is a, I don't think those are, I don't think those are acting problems. I think this is a children's movie and yep. that is, yeah, they right. were hitting a spot they needed to hit for a children's movie. So yep, I don't think, that's exactly right. I don't think I was as hard of the, uh, on them for that. Uh, not that you were overly hard cause you were not very far away from me on this, but I think that's kind of the, the differentiator between where we landed. Um, I thought those were the correct choices for the film. If this had been, mm-hmm. if you, if you sometime when you're watching, not just this movie, any, any movie aimed for children, Imagine as you're watching it, Oscar winning performances at everybody and how right. weird yeah. that movie would be. Right. Yeah. Like you need to have cheese. You've got to have cheese and, uh, and like weirdness and everybody has to be kind of a caricature mm-hmm. in a children's movie. And I think actually Val Kilmer did a really good job. I think everybody, for the most part, everybody, Val Kilmer though, I think did a really good job as Mad Mardigan, who by the way, I thought for my entire life until now that it was like Mads Mikkelsen. It was Mad Mardigan, not I did Mad too. Mardigan. I had no I idea. Until I started making my notes. Yeah. yeah uh, same thing. So, uh, but I think he did a great job of threading the needle of being like a semi serious kind of bad dude who's amazing with a sword and also like just a uh, kind of a dork. Like, uh, yeah, he's like, he's just slightly. To, he's just a couple of rungs down on the Han Solo ladder because that's what he is. He's Han Solo yes. in this film. Yeah. He's just a couple, especially like when you see him do, uh, I think he's in the snow and he is just taking out guys left and right with the sword. And that may be the part where Willow tells him you are great. And then he does a little flip with the sword and then falls on his butt. Yep. Like that's total Han Solo yes. move right there. Just a couple of rungs down. Yeah. And, and honestly, you know, he's a couple of rungs down, but also I think, in fairness, Han Solo, at least a couple of rungs better character, even without Harrison Ford. Yeah. You know, like, like the, the depth of Han Solo, I think is, is it's much deeper and more well thought out than, than Mad Mardigan is. Right. But yeah. I, you know, I think Harrison Ford did a better job as Han Solo to be clear, but mm-hmm. I do think this was, was just across the board. I think the acting was, uh, like I said, maybe not Oscar winning, but exactly what the film needed for what it was, yeah. what it was being. Uh, I, I, and I, and you know, you mentioned the humor. I think, you know, I'm going to, I'll bring this up again, longevity. I think, I think more of the humor landed for me mm-hmm. than I expected it to. Uh, there was definitely stuff that, that fell flat, but like there were definitely parts I laughed at. Right. I <laughs> you know what, you know, which I don't know if I, was, I was expecting something a little less fuzzy fuzzy yeah fuzzy I, like that whole line yeah. that he did that, that one got me you know too. what i laughed at well probably way harder than i should have when <laughs> well uh, what, while you were taking a pee pee yeah, the <laughs> what are the little things the um the little people the not like the real little people uh, the brownies. brownies yeah when they fly yeah. by on the owl and take the kid he goes ha, 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 i stole the baby <laughs> i don't yeah. know why the, the way that was delivered really got me in a yeah like perf- I, I laughed real loud, like actually out loud, genuinely out loud. Laughed at that. Uh, the brownies were a giant hit for my son. You know, and that's I've what seen, they're supposed to do. It's, I know. Yeah. Last time I saw this, I was in like 
second grade or third grade, whatever it was like in that era. So I can't be too hard on myself, but I did get probably an hour and a half into this film before I realized <laughs> that Kevin Pollack was in this. So. <laughs> yeah, I know it, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That seems weirder now seeing him do that. Yeah. It's funny. Hey, I'll tell you something on when you talked about the love story, there's something they cut out of the film that I think Maybe not exactly how they had planned it, but along this line, if they had traveled down this path, I think it would have helped with that love story. They they deleted out a portion, and I can't remember if it's an actual deleted scene or not, but they took out a portion of Sorsha's story when they get to, uh, is it, uh, to, what is the castle called? Fin, uh, fin, 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 the, I want to say Finn Rizel, but Rizel was uh, the, the lady's name. Tears Lean. Tears Lean. Yeah. When they go to Tears Lean, and all the people are frozen in those rocks. But one of them is Sorsha's dad. And we find out that the queen had imprisoned uh, the, the dad and it maybe even have killed him. But there's something that happens where like he communicates with her somehow and convinces her, look, you need to follow these people. They're doing the right thing. And you need to overthrow your mom. Yeah. So like that, that makes a little bit more so, sense and helps out yeah. with the pushing in that direction. So, you know, I, I hadn't seen that cause I, I don't have that stuff on mine or I didn't dig into that stuff on mine, but I, I, um, my thoughts on the romance were that if the, t the tent scene is where it starts to go off for me, where he like, yeah. she like fights back a little bit, but he is persistent in a uncomfortable way for a little bit. And then she just caves and is like ready to kiss yeah. him when the bag is running in. Uh, I think had, that had she been hostile that whole scene and then captive for a bit and they had had some like conversations on that captive on that ride. Maybe mm -hmm. you could explain her falling in love with him like that, but it was just so fast. It just happened yeah, so yeah. fast. It happens quickly. Um, but I, so I don't know if I said, I don't remember if I said, but I, so I came a little higher. I'm at 13, five. And like I said, I think that I think, you know, I think we're really close. I think it's just a couple of nitpicky yeah. differences in how we felt about it. Okay. Yeah. Let's go with 13. I think that's a good place for us. Uh, you want to tackle the music aspect of this film? Yeah. So, you know, I think, so I think James Horner did a great job with the score. I think yeah. it was, to me, it was largely better than uh, Titanic. Huh, yeah. uh, which he won the award yeah. that's where he got his award yeah. um th there is nothing on this that i would listen to on its own uh, but i do think it suited the film really nicely i feel like it was well matched to the emotion and action on screen to the story as it was happening i felt like it mm -hmm. all added um there was very few times i noticed it in either direction though i had to like pay attention yeah. for it which like you said you notice music if it's really great or bad, yeah. If it is solid, but maybe not exemplary, you just it just happens. Yeah. That being said, when the end credits rolled, I noticed it <laughs> right away, and I absolutely noticed that bargain basement version of Yub Nub that they just blasted across the credits. Uh, oh, so uh, that one stood out in a real, real negative, and it was like a. This was a thing that was real popular in 80s films where like the that I think they've got we've gotten away from largely now where when they mm -hmm. cut to credits the music was wildly different than yeah. than the last scene. You know, now we watch a film now and this is something that I this is something that I never really thought about uh consciously or or put any time into until this. This was the one that made me think about it. Uh, and I started thinking about it in specifically and even like I even bothered to like click through on my Plex server and check a couple of end credits as they rolled. Uh, this isn't a thing now. The, the the credits tend to roll in with whatever song the movie finished with or something very similar unless mm -hmm. the the out the the outliers in that are like some of the big theme songy films. Uh, Star Wars. Yeah. one right but that still yeah. fits the film uh the bond films they always roll like the the bond film song right uh there's there are some outliers but this was like a thing in the 80s man where we would like 
like just this like loud blast of some other song from nowhere. Uh, mm-hmm. Like the only the only thing this the only thing this didn't have was like a where are they out where are they now ten years from now like title <laughs> screen at the right. right like, like Animal House yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. Uh, I really hated the credit song. Um, uh, so it's interesting though. It's so uh, what other. See, it doesn't match. I mean, I guess it matches with it being like the village and it's a very kind of like village festival type song, but it doesn't match the rest of the score it of does, the film doesn't at match, all match any of it. Even like where, where the, else when did, they were where in else did that happen for you? Do you, do you recall recently where else that, what movie did we also do where there was one song you hated and it <laughs> stuck out? It was filled of dreams. Do yeah. you recall that? Yeah. It wasn't the same composer. Yeah. James Horner, yeah, the same it, composer yeah, right. did that same thing. Field of dreams. Yeah. And it, but that was, um, Oh, where was that song in? It was when they were doing the montage for, um, Oh, uh, when, he was, when the, he was when he was like plowing, doing the, plowing doing the, field the research, or, or doing research, or yeah, and doing the research. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's mm-hmm. right. I couldn't remember where it landed in that film, but yeah, that's right. Um, and it was the same thing. And it was it was yeah. actually a wild departure in the same direction, where it was like this weird, light, playful, cheesy, uh, uh, like almost like I don't want to go all the way to circusy, but uh, kind of circusy song that just did not fit the tone of the film at any point ever um yeah it's yub nub you're yeah, right it, it, that's what it, it is like yeah. it, it very much felt like yub nub but yub nub i i i i'm a pro yub nubber but it but <laughs> yub nub felt like <laughs> yub nub felt like it fit the ewok culture or whatever right like yeah. it felt like it belonged this this didn't feel like it belonged like we we hadn't seen anything out of uh, that village prior to this to make it to indicate this was like the vibe that we were going into. And it was just like mm-hmm. blasted at you. It wasn't the same song they played in the, at the festival when the, when the, the high Nell one comes to ask for an apprentice. Is it? I think that one's a little bit more folkier. Yeah. I think it's folkier. It, a little bit kind of Irish. Yeah. It's, twinge to it. Not like this. Yeah. If I recall. Um, And it may even have been like, I I I, I, should, I could go back, but I didn't. Uh, Maybe an offshoot of it. It, it may have been like the same bass track, but they like produced it a bunch more, right? Like added a lot more, uh, more instrumentation or volume to it. But <laughs> more volume. That's all you need with the version you watched, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It was. It was <laughs> like when the. That's the other thing too, and this probably made it worse. When the end credits came on, it was like a. <laughs> jump tenfold in the volume. I was like, oh my God. Oh God. Uh but all that said though, like I do I did like I said, I did like it. The score's great the, overall. The overall though. the score's yeah. really great. It it fits really well. It it um it is a very it's for sure additive for the most part. Yeah. So I, yeah. I landed at 13 for music. I am a little higher. I'm at I'm at 14.5. Everything you said, I feel the same. I bumped it up though because there are two themes, two songs or themes or whatever you want to call them in the score that are just memorable, and they play them a few times. Uh, there's like a really softer one where where you have some of the sweeter scenes. Let me see if I can remember that that softer one does a little uh, the the do 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 no 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 that that one they they play a few times. And that one's very memorable. Even after the film, you can remember that one. Uh, but the one they that you just can't ever forget, me having watched this when I was younger, still to this day, I'm not going to lie to you, sometimes it pops in my head when there's like an action, something happening, and and it's the dun-da-dun, 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 dun That one right there, you see a lot with Mad Mardigan too. That one right there, to me, if we're going to talk about how much is it worth, how much is it valuable how, how or how valuable is it to me those bump it up a little bit so that's how i got to 14.5 um you know what would you say about 14 ish maybe not quite split but still give this thing some for for what it did yeah for sure we can do that uh, uh, that's, that's fair you know what's funny 14 is that flat with that one the, the two songs you you mentioned uh the the action mm-hmm. theme there uh i would recognize but for sure haven't thought about since second grade. Uh, and the other one, I did not stick with me past the film at all. Like, oh, really? Yeah, no, they just did not. Neither one of them landed for me in like a, neither one of them landed for me in a like memorable past the movie experience 
kind of way. I shouldn't say that. I, like I said, I would not, ra- not so much the softer one. Yeah, you're you're right there. The the more energetic one. That one. Sure that did. one. If I heard the, it, I would go. Oh, yeah. that's. It, I would know it for yeah. sure. That that yeah. That's more. That's probably more uh, accurate. It's when when I watch the film again and I hear that tune come on in very specific parts where they put it. I'm like, oh, I totally remember this. I completely. Yeah, hey, that's a good. That's a good call. But yeah, yeah I, I think I think fourteen ish is a, a good spot to land. All right, let's talk about technique. I've got uh, a hand. The, the technique's odd on this one because with technique, we talk about mostly camera work. How can you tell the story with the lens? But we do give credit for special effects. We don't give much credit unless unless it's things that just change the industry. Or, you know, think of, of Star Wars A New Hope in 77. Think of The Matrix with Bullet Time. Things like that. And this one really did. It's not going to be to the effect of, you know, everybody knows that this was the film that did it. But the people who know, like the people who are in the industry, they know that it was this film that came up with some of those visual effects that were just absolutely groundbreaking. And of course, you get it from a from a company like like Lucasfilm. Yeah. So with this category, there, there's a there's a little bit of both uh, in here where it comes to practical special effects. And then the camera work. Now, and until we, until we set, or until I uh, watched it the second time this weekend, I was more so, more so on the side of like the technical portions of it, or more than the camera. But then, then it just kind of dawned on me. I kept thinking, why are they always? A lot of this film is a lot of tight shots, right? It's a lot of just medium and close-up shots. And they're good. They're really good shots of the baby and Willow at the beginning establishes the relationship, you know, things like that. But I kept wondering, I was like, why do they continually just do this? And then I just forgot about it. And then, you know, this morning I was brushing my teeth and it just, you know, in the, in the bathroom, not thinking of anything. And it kind of, it kind of started poking at me a little bit. And I thought, you know, I, I bet, I don't know this, but I bet Ron Howard took the 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 process of being having these tight shots, a lot of close up, a lot of tight shots at the beginning, and then it it backs out. You don't get as many as the film goes on. You get out into the real world, you get out into the open world, and we start backing up a little bit. And I think it has to do with like Willow's character. He's in that village. Everything is is there. Like like you know, it's 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 the place where the hobbits live, right? It's just their own little village. They don't go out into the to the larger world. They 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 stay in their own little culture and that's where we get all those tight shots. And then once we get out into the open world and we get to the adventure and we get all these great matte paintings and these shots and everything starts opening up and we get a little wider and you really start to see the scale of that, of that aspect ratio, that anamorphic aspect ratio that they put in. And so I thought oh, they, that that's really what he did. That's what I got out of it. But if that's what he did and Bravo, cause that worked out. I thought really well as far as some of the, some of the camera work. I mean, there was some other really cool things that he did. Like the, uh, we got a little bit of a, kind of like an evil dead style when we had that uh, point of view camera, like when the dogs attacked the village. And there's a few times where we get Willow's perspective uh, with a handheld. Um, but overall, I'm really impressed with the camera work. If, if what I said was actually intentional, that, that's what I, that's what I'm picking up out of it. I'll let you talk more about the special effects if you've got some stuff on that. But I think overall, I'm really, I'm really high on technique, high on technique, higher than I thought it would be for Will. I'm at 14.5. Um, I think, I think the thing that I'm having the issue with, with technique, maybe it dings longevity a little bit. The special effects, although groundbreaking and revolutionary for, for what they were doing, some of it just really doesn't hold up too well. Like specifically the, the brownies and the green screens and things like that. It just didn't look that great anymore. Yeah. That's, that's where the, like I have a lot of criticisms about some of that stuff, uh, specifically around lighting. Uh, Mm -hmm. but I think a lot of the practical effects looked great. Um, but yeah, like the brownies, like the like the green screening, and actually even in some of the matting, even in some of like the the yeah the the matte backgrounds, the foreground. If you're light, looking for it. It's there. The yeah. foreground lighting is so much brighter than the background lighting, in, yeah. in like I, a yeah, borderline haloing kind of way. That like mm-hmm. that that's just 
that's not a tech, that's not a, uh, technology for the time kind of thing. I have seen, I mean, I have seen plenty of films from, from this period with matting and, and background replacements of whatever type you need to do where the lighting is closer. Uh, this, I feel like that was just a, a ball dropped on, on how far off, like there, there are, there are scenes with the brownies, uh, particularly in that tavern mm-hmm. where they're like in a dark room and the brownies yeah. like lit like they're outside in midday. Yeah. And it's like, holy crap. Like, can somebody it turn makes that light outline down? really? Yeah, yeah. It makes that outline really stand out. It's like too. A, yeah. It makes a really sharp outline. Like it's mm-hmm. like, you know, it, it looks like a sticker put on a screen, you know? Yeah. Uh, it also, and it also makes the foreground seem really flat because it, mm-hmm. it, it pulls all the depth out of it. Yeah, I, some of that, some of that stuff really, I feel like, was oddly below my bar for Lucasfilm stuff. Yeah, right. Like Lucasfilm did better mats and stuff in effects lar- across the board in in the Star Wars movies. And I know this is you know apples and oranges, whatever. But, but this was much later, and I saw mistakes. Yeah. I saw mistakes that they didn't make in the, uh, yeah Lucasfilm didn't have in some of their previous works. So, I mean, I mean, we're talking, this was Lucasfilm, you know, post star Wars during Indiana Jones stuff, right? Like this is peak Lucasfilm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, outside of what you said, um, you know, the only, the only things that I had really were like some of the criticisms on the special effects there. And I really, I actually really dug how good, some of the practical effects, like I mentioned earlier, like the Cronenberg esque, like gnarly mm-hmm. practical effects, looked pretty solid for for what they were. Um, that yeah. troll when he hits the troll with the wand, that was gnarly. Yeah. I thought that was, yeah. I thought that looked yeah. pretty good. The dogs really stood out yeah, too. The, the, oh, uh, some of the creature the creature design was really good. You know, I think they did the same thing they did in Solo, uh, a Star Wars story, uh, with the dogs. They just you know, put the costume on the dogs and let the dog's movement speak for itself. Yeah. And that's definitely what you got out of this. That was not any kind of. Yeah. It didn't look weird uh, or, yeah. you know, I'm glad they didn't go with stop motion or claymation or anything, <laughs> right. Right. which was big, yeah. which was big in these films in this period. Right. Uh, well, we got a bit of it with, uh, it, it, you know, the, the, the animal or the, the monster, which they have a name for it. And I'll, let me see if I can remember the name. They, they didn't, they don't put it anywhere in like public published it. But the name of that two-headed monster was Ebersisk. It was the name of it. And the, re- the reason they did that was the same reason why he named uh, George Lucas named the one of the bad guys, General Kale. They're named after actual people that he that he had a beef with or something. Kale was like this critic, uh, film critic that always was harping on Lucas. Uh, Ebersisk is uh, Siskel and Ebert. <laughs> so he <laughs> took their two names yeah. and put it together. Uh, that's funny. But yeah, that was that's like a very Rancor you remember the monster right. uh, in, yeah. in Return of the Jedi underneath Jabba's palace? That Rancor is a very kind of that stop motion type uh, type monster. Yeah, you can get because that's what it looked like to me. You can get away with that stop motion kind of monster mm-hmm. on something like the Rancor or like you know I didn't think it was too bad on on this thing either. Um, that is like the you know the the monster's attributes might lend themselves to slower movement or whatever, right? Where it's okay. Yeah. But when you see films of this, where they have like the 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 dogish werewolf esque kind of yeah. creatures, things that in your mind are fast moving, scary things, and then they're yeah, like, you know what it what it's going to move like. Yeah, where you you have an idea. Yeah, you see, you have a a a real life idea example of what the movement should be like, and then they they go with that stop motion. It is that's when it really stands out to me as a as a bad choice, um, and yeah. they they didn't do that in this one, so. Um, I think that was, I think they did well with whatever they, however they handled the dogs put the costumes on dogs or whatever it is, is, uh, it was good. They, they did a really good job with this, this, from a technical standpoint, this film really stood out. They did a, a great job with the sound, which you would get with the sound. It was Ben Burt uh, who did the sound for yeah, this. There was some, and there was actually some really it. cool, really cool sounds and cool sounds. And if you, if anybody goes back and watches it, Listen in the background in a lot of scenes. It's this thing is layered with just noise, like additional 
or supplementary type noises yeah. that you would hear in certain situations. And I'm not talking about like scenes where there's a ton of people in the room, like at the, at the village uh, meeting or council or whatever, but just random stuff. Like when he sleds down the hill and he hits, he runs into the, um, uh, runs into the house and then, you know, Mad, Mad Marian comes down in an avalanche. Just listen to the background discussions being held with villagers or, you know, some every once in a while you, you, you'll get like an animal in the background that probably would be there. It's just all those little things like that really stood There's out a ton for, of depth for to the it. sound. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, the perfect way to say it. it a lot of depth. Yeah. This, you know, this is the kind of thing where like, you know, if you have a good surround sound or you're watching with headphones, you may think you heard something behind you for real, right? Like, yes, that, that did happen to me. Yeah, it, it happened to me, happened to me a happened. couple of times yeah. too. Yeah. Um, uh, where sure. like you would just instinctively snap your head cause you, th- you thought you heard something. Right. But then mm-hmm. oh, that's just the movie. Right. Uh, yeah. ton of depth. Yeah. And that's, that's all Ben Burt, right? He's, he got nominated for, uh, for an, an Oscar for this film. Uh, poor guy. He was up against who framed Roger rabbit that year. So, you know, rightfully so he, he probably lost, but yeah, I thought the sound was great. I thought that was really, really well done. All right. So where did, where did you land? Uh, 13, five, I had 13, five. You want to just do a, I don't know, where you want to land? You want to go middle, 14? Uh, be, go, I think we should go, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put a little credence into, uh, your camera idea and pretend that that's accurate and intentional and not just an idea. Uh, so I think we should creep a little bit up towards you. Okay, cool. Ty goes to the runner there on that one. For, we'll do 14 to 50 for yep. technique. Yep. Yeah. Here's where we start to fade. At least we do with me. Uh, just as far as like. This is my act one, right? For you, this is where I start to get a little bit of a lull. Longevity and uniqueness are t- are always tough for me to try to figure out where to where to fall. For both longevity and uniqueness, I came in exactly the same. I'm at twelve thousand for longevity and twelve thousand for uniqueness. Basically, I think with longevity, you know, I'm I'm I know that it's got some following, and I know that I know that when I watched it, it still held up. But there's some stuff that didn't hold up. We talked about that already. And I feel like this thing is probably a little bit better than average only because I, it's just gained momentum. I mean, clearly it's gained momentum. It's still loved and, and we're getting a Disney plus series about it. But like I said, a little bit of the litmus test for me with longevity when I can is what do my kids think about it? Did it, did it still hold with a, with a seven or 10 or 12 year old kid 30 years later. And I mean, the answer was yes. So I bumped it up over the, over the halfway mark, put it right around 12,000 for longevity. Uh, what, what did you get for longevity? I, I wasn't horribly far off from you. I was higher. Uh, I think, I think it held up really well overall. I think the hero's journey is something that will always be relatable. Um, yeah. it is such, it is just a, such a human storyline, right? It is the, uh, it is the, the hero's journey is, is exactly how we want our heroes to to thrive to mm-hmm. to grow in their role and meet their challenge and go through their transformation and save the world and have their return like the whole return home everything you know and you if you when you see a film that departs off the hero's journey too far you usually hear complaints, even from people who have never heard of the hero's journey about, well, it was weird that this didn't happen or that didn't happen. Right. Like it is such a human thing. I think the hero's journey will stick around for forever. It'll, it holds up. Right. Um, I think, I think more of the humor landed for me than for you, just from the tone of, I was talking about the humor. Um, although some Mm -hmm. of it was rough. I think there was some, uh, visuals, uh, some of that special effects that, that felt, dated but a lot of it didn't a lot of it held up better than a, than I was expecting I think I think there yeah. might be some like a bit of of expectations versus reality on this one for me because I think looking at a mid 80s mid late 80s film I was expecting a mid late 80s film that had a lot of yeah. a lot of that grunge on it and this didn't have a yeah. lot of that um and I think it does also benefit quite a bit from being like the uh, period fantasy because even now films that come out now, a lot of the look stylistically of those things is similar. You still have like, like we still see a lot of magic wands that are just shaved tree branches. And we still see a lot of villages uh, that are like, 
that village and the the castles are still you know like that dark heavy metal 80s castle kind of look you know we, we still see yeah. a lot of those same visuals this just happens to look like it was you know filmed 30 years ago um i think a lot of that stuff a lot of that stuff plays to me a little bit better than i was expecting and well, i wouldn't say this is something that's going to be you know this is i think if you have no nostalgia for this it the the you know showing this to somebody today our, our age or not for the first time i think probably going to land a little you know on your kid's side of like eh, you know um but I was at 13, a little bit higher. I just think it held up a lot better than a lot of films from this, of this, of this genre of this era. I think it holds up pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I get that. Let's, uh, let's call it 12, five. And I was also at 12 for uniqueness. Did you, did you also come in something lower? I was lower. A little, a little lower. Yeah. Yeah. I landed at 10 for uniqueness. And, okay. and I don't actually have a ton to say here other than here's where like, here's the the downside of the hero's journey. Hey, this is like, we've seen this format of story a billion times and mm-hmm. where some people play with the format a little bit. They nudge the boundaries a little. You don't want to nudge it too far because then it feels like the, the hero's triumph is un, unearned. Um, but some people nudge the story a little, nudge the journey a little bit here, nudge the journey a little bit there. And like this one, Lucas in general, he tends to like to just kind of walk directly on that path. Right. (laughs) Right. Just directly on that path. And it's a little formulaic because of that. Um, it's not bad. I think that that actually helped the film. And like you said, in a couple other categories here, but I think Mm -hmm. when you look at uniqueness and you look at that formula and how often it has been used and is still being used, there's a ding there. Uh, yeah. The medieval esque fantasy film magic and trolls and, uh, all of that, the evil sorceress and all of that. Um, not the first time we've seen that, right? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. and not the last time we've seen it either. It's very tropey and very genre influence heavy. I, I think a lot of that stuff, I mean, the you, I think the a lot of the unique stuff from this shows up. I think I give it more points, more credit in like technique, right? Or in... Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I don't think I think it's unique because this technical the technical prowess is good, but I don't think that that lands in the spirit of uniqueness, the category for me, the way it, the way it lands. I think that lands another a different category. I don't I don't really have a lot in uniqueness, pro or con to say here because it, yeah. it feels very like on the unique spectrum. It feels very right down the middle over home plate. Like this is a this is one of those films. Right. Like, yeah, this is this is one of those medieval fans. Like this is the um, the Lord of the Rings without the license. Right. This is, Mm -hmm. you know, if I read you when I read you that log line, if you had never seen this film, you could tell me what's going to happen. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's it's, it's going to fit. It's going to fit. Exactly. And that's 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 kind of where I stood with uniqueness, too. It was. I, I know what's going to happen the first time I can predict it. There might be a thing here to a thing here and there that. You think, oh, that's pretty cool, or yeah, that's 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 different. No one's ever done that. I mean, and but we gave them some of that credit and technique. You know, it's like the whole animal changing thing. No one saw that before. No one had seen it to that level. Right. Well, I gave some of that bonus and and technique. I give a little bit in uniqueness. That, that that's why I, I'm a little bit north of the the halfway mark is because I think there were some things that it did offer, but it, you're right. Over, overall, I think it just. It, it walks that line. So I, so I, is, I ended up directly down the middle at 10 and, and I'll, I'll say why, because I did think about some of that stuff technique wise, whatever in this category, mm-hmm. because it does fit here, but I'll tell you why I ended up at 10 because I think if you take that stuff out, if you take out the bit of uniqueness that it does have there and look yeah. at this film, um, uh, story structure, the characters, the, the environment, the setting, all of that stuff. This, this film doesn't come north of like five or seven. 
right? Yeah. It is it it is just borderline on uniqueness. It's just another. It, it, there's so many of these films that fit, and a lot of them that did like the same, like pulled the same, like oh, we gotta have a Hobbit race. Let's get a Hobbit race. We gotta have mm-hmm. a troll race. Let's let's get some like you know like a lot of them pulled a lot a lot of that those same strings. I think if you didn't, if you had never seen this film or any of these films from the eighties and then you just, somebody put you in a room and played them all back to back, you would feel like this was just one of them, right? Yeah. This will, where it would stand out. Like you said, there'd be some visuals and things like that and tech, tech technique. Jeez, I can't even talk that, um, <laughs> that would, that would separate it from some of those. But mm-hmm. I don't think without that, without that stuff, it makes it the 10 to me. Well, let's keep it just north of the halfway mark. Let's call it 11. Yeah, that's uh, good. I'll, I'll come down. And man, that should do us. That is going to give us a grand total. $64,750. Do you have where that's going to put us on the guest list? I do. Uh, that comes in a perfect exact $1,000 below <laughs> galaxy quest is that is that the bar then which you measure <laughs> it's number 15 on the guest list but <laughs> well that's not the baseline <laughs> that is well it's it's in fairness it is the one right below galaxy quest it's also yeah. a perfect exact so I'll, this is what this, i like this too it's also a perfect exact two thousand dollars above the village it is yeah it is a even yeah, number is. above and below it's to the, the the bread of the willow sandwich, and it is fifteen on the list. Yeah, yeah. So think about that. You you go into you go into the pawn shop or or wherever, and you want to sell them. You got the village and willow and Galaxy Quest. And they're gonna pay you a little bit more for Galaxy Quest than willow, and they'll pay you a little bit more for willow than they will for the village. Magnitude wise, does that make sense? I I, I think so. I think so. Especially when people would ask, no way, no Willow's worth more than galaxy quest. I, I think you got to go back and listen to that episode. There are some things that there are a couple extra things that probably are correct. And they push galaxy quest a little bit ahead of, of Willow on, on worth. Galaxy quest is a sleeper, came out of man. that. You didn't, yeah, oh, it is. There's oh, some stuff in that you don't expect. Yeah, it is a sleeper. It is a lot smarter than people think it is. Well, let's talk about the definitive list. So our definitive list, Started off top 25 films that we pulled from from the American Film Institute's random. They've got all these lists. So we pulled a few from each category and uh, and populated a top 25 list. And it's got everything on it from, you know, Vertigo to Toy Story to The Third Man. It's got all the, all different types of films from all different genres. And as our guests and listeners and our own staff selections... As we started uh, evaluating these films, uh, we populated the the definitive list based on what they're worth. Willow comes in on the definitive. Doesn't make the top twenty five. It comes in at number thirty four, and again, that is that's in that's right below Galaxy Quest and it's right above the Village. We look at the thirty to thirty five range here, so we're looking at films like The Third Man, uh, being thirty, uh, Usual Suspects, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Then Galaxy Quest, then Willow, then The Village. Uh, man, Evil Dead. I'm surprised that it's 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 below all those, but yeah, you know, kind of it is where it is. Evil Evil Dead. Evil Dead has some real greatness to it, but man, it has it's it's got some rough around the edges. Yeah, it's not polished whatsoever. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's amazing. Like like we said, I don't want to turn this into an Evil Dead episode here. We're wrapping up, but. Uh, I do still find it amazing that this is like a what was he nineteen or twenty year old dude right out of film school made that made that it is yeah that is an achievement. Evil Dead, the amount for technique that that what it's worth in technique is unbelievable. Uh, especially exactly what you said when you think about him, uh, Sam Raimi coming what nineteen years old to do that. It to me it's just it's phenomenal that he was able to do that. Um, all right, so our next film that we're going to appraise, we're going to have a guest on. Uh, a guest we had on, gosh, man, it's been a long time. Uh, probably, it might have been 2019? I have no idea. How Maybe time, early 20? I have no idea how time works anymore. 
<laughs> it was so we're gonna have a guest we had on previously, previously on the film appraisers. Pre- pre- previous guest that we had on, uh, he responded to a Facebook post uh, on. See, there was a soundtrack that I bought, a vinyl soundtrack, and I couldn't believe that that film had hit ten years, which makes it eligible to be on the film appraisers. And I posted that. He responded and said he wanted to do it. So we got him into the, we got, we got him plugged in. Uh, it's been a while since we talked about it with him, but we got him plugged in. So he's going to come on and Joe, he has sent us a soundbite for his film. You want to share that with us? You know, I do. We dig that <laughs> thing out and we'll see what you got. You've got mail. Dude, this thing claims I have mail. It's amazing what we can do with computers these days. Dude, now I'm reading it. So happy for you. Dear Mr. Pilgrim, it has come to my attention that we will be fighting soon. My name is Matthew Patel, and blah, 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 blah. Fair warning. Mono e mano, seven evil, blah, blah. This is. This is. This is. What? This is boring. Delete. Yeah, I've, I've never seen that. Oh, really? Yeah, I've never seen that. I, I think you're in for a treat. In the way that it's adapted from the comic, actually, it's not comic. A lot of it, it may be a manga uh, novel, but anyway, it, it, it's an animated, you know, graphic novel. And the way Edgar Wright made that into a film and preserved that comic book graphicness of it, awesome. He did a really good job. I'm, I'm really, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward like to seeing one. it. I, I, I am very fond of Edgar Wright, so yeah, that'd be a good one. Joe, what is going on around the network? Actually, you know what? Forget the network. Why don't you tell us what's going on with Barrel House? I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah. So um, I just did, I just, the last two episodes I released were both kind of uh, list, listicle, clickbait list, list episodes, sort of. <laughs> I did a Christmas episode and I did, I did like a, a 2020 whiskey retrospective because I couldn't taste anything. So I didn't yeah. really have the ability to, uh, give in-depth tasting notes um but my taste is starting to come back um it was maybe 30 percent back during the last show and i'm gonna say it's probably around 60 65 percent back now so the next episode will be a finally it will be a return to the reviews um i've already got the whiskey picked out and i think it will be a way popular one um i also started doing the live streams and the first two were a li- i'm gonna be I, i'm gonna be honest they were a little rough uh, because I had a lot of tech stuff to figure out. There's a lot of, there's probably more dead air than there should have been because I was receiving messages like, Hey, there's no sound on Twitch. What's going on with the fact that there's no <laughs> yeah, sound right. on Twitch? Uh, so there's a little bit of that going on, but I th- as the bugs get worked out, um, I planning on getting those live streams, uh, to like a once or twice a month, depending on demand, um, for at least for now, regular thing. Um, it's tough. It's tough to get all that set up uh, in in a basement away from everything over Wi-Fi with a laptop that has a hard time running OBS. But uh, whatever, I'm gonna I'm gonna make it work, and it's gonna be fun. I think. I mean, they were a little they were a little uh, buggy. We'll say they're a little like cyberpunk. They're just a little buggy, but they were still fun. So, <laughs> right. but we're so, still uh, playing it. So there you go. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, uh, I think, you know, that's kind of what I got going on. The, geez, I think as this episode we're recording now drops, it will be the same weekend that uh, Barrel House reviews come back. So look for that. Definitely. Yeah. You can find that at the website, com, and definitely check it out. If you want to check out some of our other social media feeds, uh, get in touch with us through email, our website, our merchandise. We've got all that in the show notes. You can find that. Our Twitter is at F appraisers on Instagram. You can find us at film appraisers. Email is super easy. Film appraisers at gmail.com. Like I said, the website, eargluemedia.com slash TFA. You can also find eargluemedia.com slash discord. will provide you your own personal invite to the discord server. Come talk with us. And if you'd like to check out some of the merchandise, we'll get more up. But if you'd like to check some of that out, tpublic.com slash users slash the film appraisers. And while you were, so I'm going to paint you a picture of a perfect day, right? You're going to 
jump on. You're going to put the show on, listen to it. You've already this far in and you're thinking, man, the show is already over. I just want more film appraisers in my life. So then you're going to jump on. You're going to hit us up on Instagram, like Josh said. You're going to follow us and look through all of our awesome posts. And you're going to send us an email about how much you love us. You're going to join the Discord right after you order your film appraisers t-shirt. And then while you're on there, after you join the Discord, you're going to think, you know what I should do right now? I should jump on iTunes and rate and review the show because I know that makes a huge difference for those guys. Yeah. That that is a perfect day because you didn't mention Twitter, which makes it the absolute, the absolute <laughs> yeah. well, perfect day. Listen, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest. Um, without going into like uh, current events too much, uh, I'm just like feeling like I don't ever want to go on Twitter. Again I'm right I now. I'm not gonna lie to you. This morning I thought about just pulling the show from Twitter because I am done with that dumpster fire of a uh, social media site. You know it's. Um, it can be re- real talk about Twitter, something you didn't think you would find on the film appraisers. <laughs> <laughs> it can be extremely useful. It's a great way to interact with people. There's a lot of people on there. It's a, like, I feel I seem to, to get a, as much or maybe a little more about ballparky, as much interaction as far as like DMs and stuff on Twitter as on Instagram. But uh, just as it is as good for feeding you current events or whatever it's also the most negative place on the planet it is yeah. so negative and, yeah. and i don't mean that in like you know i you know we have the film pages twitter and i have the barrel house one and I, I don't mean it's negative like in interactions with people directly on there i haven't had any negative interactions for either show on there mm-hmm. but just like the general mood of people and their tweets and what you can read on twitter it's all just it's a, an endless scroll of negativity yeah we need to start a myspace page I miss Tom. We need to get back on. Uh, we need, we need oh, to get back on MySpace. I'm never going back to MySpace. There are <laughs> pictures. There are pictures of me on MySpace from when I was uh, a late teenager. Uh, that's probably lined up with when I was from MySpace, late mid to late teenager. And no one ever needs to see mid to late teenager Joe ever again. <laughs> well, if we start a new page, our first our first picture uh, will be you in your Nicolas Cage shirt, guaranteed. Yes. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, We really appreciate it. And thank you all for listening. Goodbye. The Film Appraisers was created by Josh McRae, produced by Joe Kane and Josh McRae, graphics by Albert Padilla, and voiceover by Morgan Marshall. The thoughts, expressions, views, opinions, and the like are those of the guests and the host of the film appraisers and do not represent the opinions of any entity associated with the creation or distribution of the films discussed herein.